This week's episode of This Is Only A Test is made possible with support from Evident. Evident is revolutionizing the way personal data is shared. Their simple, secure platform lets businesses confidently know who they're dealing with without handling sensitive personal data. With connections to thousands of authoritative sources through a single API, Evident is the only platform that enables comprehensive, accurate, and up-to-date identity and credential verifications. Check out evidentid.com slash test to sign up today and get started. That's evidentid.com slash test. Now on with the show. For Thursday, September 26th, 2019, welcome to This Is Only A Test, the official podcast of tested.com. Welcome to the show, everyone. We are live on location this week, so it might sound a little bit different, but if you're watching the video, you know it's different already because we have a different lineup. Jeremy, you're here with me. We're here, here at Oculus Connect 6. OC6. OC6, one of your favorite conventions of the year. Well, <laughs> I, I like VR, Norm. I like VR I too. do like the virtual and, reality. And AR? AR2 now? <laughs> That's true. You have to like both, although, we don't see a whole lot of AR here yet, Not but yet. one day. One day, yeah. Dave, yeah. Uh, and also, as a special guest, uh, we have Davinja Hardwar. Hey, hey. Uh, you're here from Engadget. From Engadget and oh. all the way from New York, yeah. All the way from New York. So you're your first Oculus My first Connect. Oculus Connect. I mean, I fly over for a lot of conventions, but uh, I've not done this one yet, and I feel like after the Quest and after the Rift F, uh, after the Rift S, I knew I had to be here this year. Like, and I you figured, reviewed those. I you reviewed them, the yeah. VR stuff for Engadget. Yep. Um, big fan of your work for a long time. Thank you. For people who don't know, you also are a part of the Slash Film podcast yes. with those folks talking about movies. So the perfect person. We could not find, <laughs> I think, a better person to fill in for Kishore this this week cool. now that we're uh, at OC6. So we're going to obviously have a lot of VR talk this episode because there are a lot of announcements. Not yet. But not yet. Oh. Jeremy, we're going to make you wait. Okay. We're going to make you wait. We're, it's not going to be a full episode either. I know you have appointments to get to, Devendra, but you cover tech, of course. I want to hear about some of the stuff that you've been covering, uh, some of the things that were announced in the tech world while we're here at OC6. Uh, you're also a new dad. Congratulations. Yes, thank you. I think also, we, like in the same time frame with you, Norm. I Nora. know. Yeah, I think so we're, we're like synchronized right yeah, now. Yeah, I, I see your tweets yeah. like about your, your daughter and it's and your reviews, of course. You read a bunch of really cool baby gear. Yeah, she started, I think at three months, she started in a baby gadget like review set. Oh. For us and gadget, nice. and she was, she really um, proved herself to be really perfect on camera. Like I was holding her during my whole script and stand up, and she didn't, she didn't make a sound. She was just like chill, looking at the camera, and like when I stopped talking, she like cooed at the exact right moment. Like perfect, <laughs> the baby made for the camera. So you put yeah. your your baby on camera too, and just sh photos. Share your baby with the world. <laughs> yes, that, is that a conscious choice? I mean, I mean, I, I know certainly a lot of people don't want to do that, right. and certainly. If you're a media person and you have a large following, people want to keep that stuff separate. You know, that's fine. I don't. I try not to overload her presence online too much, but yeah. I also I feel like I think it's kind of fun. Basically and, and I think her. you know when we think about tech and some of the frivolousness of the gear that we buy and yeah. cover, the best way to make that seem less frivolous is to use it for a meaningful way. And mm -hmm. in our case, it's families, and so many people buy new phones, new cameras to document their oh, family yeah. life. Oh, yeah. And so this seems like a ripe opportunity. I mean, it's the reason that, I'm gonna put that mea culpa out there, I bought the new iPhone. <laughs> is that our top story this week? Oh, sure. Please. Your phone purchase? <laughs> for the honor Congratulations. Did you do it with your iPhone. Apple card? I did do it with my, my <laughs> Apple card. So, Devinder, you might not know, a couple uh -huh. weeks ago, I declared on the podcast, I believe it was before the keynote, before the Apple event, I said I would not get one this year. Okay. I was on a 10. Jeremy's on a 10. We felt like that was a good enough upgrade. Mm -hmm. We felt like next year we know 5G's coming. Sure. You know, probably a new better redesign, design, probably. Right? Yeah, yeah. The big rumors are it's going to go back to the iPhone 4 style, you know, which Leica, is better, a band, better which design. absolutely yeah. better design. Mm -hmm. um, but I caved once I saw the photos yeah. uh, the, of the, the pro. Of the pro. Yeah. Yeah, and that wide-angle camera sure. has been really, really good. I did go to the Apple Store to try out that wide-angle camera, and it is 
amazing. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's like having a fisheye lens on it your is. phone. It, it is. Yeah. You know, it's a 13 mil equivalent, and most people, when they talk about like, the trinity of lenses they buy on their DSLRs, on the wide side, you usually get 1635. So you rarely go wider right. than 15, 16 millimeters, and even then, you don't shoot that because sure. you sure. get a lot of distortion. So the fact that they could put a 13 mil equivalent, which and chose to make that the yeah. one across both the 11s right. and not the telephoto. You know, we speculated it was because it's probably better for AR kit, and I think that's 100% the case. Mm -hmm. You know, they're going to do better world mapping with mm -hmm. a wide angle lens to actually fix focus. There's no manual focus change on the wide angle lens, uh, and you know, it's it's. Pretty, it's a unique view of the world for video mm -hmm. also. So yeah, on video, is it the same wide angle or is it slightly? It is slightly cropped in, just like with the standard 26 mil. If you use video, it kind of reframes it a little sure. bit. But just a little bit? Just a little bit. Okay. From what yeah. I've seen, it reminds me of like the Sony, um, I like the Sony Alpha lineup, and mm -hmm. they have these great, um, what do you call them? Like the really small lenses, I would tell you, like the ones that make them almost flat. And the flesh, pancake, yeah. The pancake lenses, and those, I really like those, and those have like a nice wide view of the world. It's almost like that. Not quite, but certainly an amazing thing to have on your phone. For sure. Totally. Yeah. 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 You don't even need built-in image stabilization because at that wide, mm -hmm. uh, it, it's already pretty stable. And you know, there's like a minimum focus distance. Like things get really blurry. Mm -hmm. You can't do kind of the the bokeh effect or wide angle. Uh, but that one's really nice. The other thing that since the phones are now now out and people can go check them out at the store is uh, the green color. Yeah, I'm sold on that green. Oh, color. the dark green, the barely green. green. Yeah. So, like in different lighting, it looks like a different color. I saw it in like a dim room, and it just looks great. It, it looks just great. looks like fine. Yeah. This it's you're weird. the only person I know that this matters to because you actually don't use a case. Yeah, everyone else, unless it's clear, they'll yeah. never know what color their phone is. Right. Uh, people have described it as a Boba Fett like color. Okay. I, sure. I think it's even darker than that. It's more of a granite green. Yeah. Is what I would call it. Yeah. A granite green. And it is, it's a new one. Yeah. I was over at uh, our friend Gary Wood's house this weekend. He got the green one. And, yeah. And I was definitely envious of that. Mm -hmm. But yeah, 3% back on the Apple card, I think you know, it makes sense. <laughs> yeah. Good deal. Yeah. And of course, now extends to Uber Eats and uh, Walgreens, CVS, so mm -hmm. more, more than cashback. Do you use back. any other like fancy points cards? Like, how, does I it do. compare to those? And I have a, everyone has that friend. Like, you know how everyone yeah. has a Bitcoin, a crypto friend, right? Yeah. Our crypto friend is behind the camera right there. It's got the there. points friend. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and everyone also has like the credit card points friend. Yeah. Who like maybe this person who like loves getting the comps at Vegas or just knows all the things. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. I think you've got to judiciously choose. Like, yeah. And, and, and I was his Apple Card friend for a week, <laughs> and so he called me so I, he could save the thirteen bucks on the on the new watch. Okay. Yes. <laughs> you gotta you gotta do it. Yeah. Thank, thanks for ratting me out, Jeremy. <laughs> yep. I got the watch too. Yeah. Um, uh, what were which watch were you upgrading from? Series two. Okay, so that's so good. Two to justified. Five yeah. is, four I think, to five justified. seems no, not that's so frivolous. much. Yeah. Yeah. I Did really like the four. That was a nice design leap. Oh, yeah. absolutely. You get the bigger screen. Yeah. It's like narrower. The, the compass, sure, whatever for the five. The always on is the the big yeah. thing. I'll, I'll say the thing that I did mm. not notice in reviews for the always on is the weirdness of. The, uh, your behavior changes. Like people mm -hmm. who wear have worn Apple Watches for a couple years now, n are triggered by the, the taptic feedback. When they get a notification, their Do muscle the memory yeah. is to twist up. Yeah. Now that you don't have that, the animations of like messages showing up or don't animate in the low power mode. Okay. And yeah, so, because it's like what one refresh rate? Or it's one exactly. Or something, it goes yeah. down to basically you know a frame a second or yeah. something very low. And so that's a bit of a disconnect. Huh. But be, they do when you raise? What, what, yeah, so you do have to forcefully raise. Yep. And so low, low power mode, the always on is really only to tell time. Yeah, it's like an e-ink screen, basically. Exactly. It's just like the last yeah, thing it was right. showing. Yeah. Yeah. So they're, for, for lay people, mm -hmm. they may feel like they're, it, it doesn't work exactly as they had hoped. Mm -hmm. Because you know, you'll see an animation, and if you then put your wrist down, the animation will freeze, and it'll kind of fade and blur in the background. Hmm. Okay. Yeah. That's okay. So, so I just, just feel like uh, the the opening, uh, basically this twist motion mm -hmm. reminds me of like Snowpiercer. It's sort of like that's what Apple taught us. We just have the the twist motion. Oh, when, when they have the time, the people, clock. Yes. Entire yes. generation of people have learned this this stupid motion when we could have just like looked at our watches normally before. I don't know. It's weird. I um, lost an entire afternoon to this problem because my stepdad did not. It wasn't working. Right. Right. And I feel like I'm a tech guy, mm -hmm. and I didn't think to check he uh, what if he was on the drama mode uh -huh. theater mode theater mode yep. we went to yep. an apple store to solve it yeah oh my gosh it was, really i was so embarrassed <laughs> it was horrible the theater mode requires you to then tap to to bring up the display that was the so that stays off humiliating experience of 2019 i think yeah but wow. I, I feel like they have not improved the the algorithm 
they're not doing some deep learning mm -hmm. for your behavior, for the, for the risks. Uh, activation. Sure. Yeah, I feel like sure. there's an opportunity for them to still improve that. Yeah, that's not what Apple side. really does. That's like a Google thing, right? They all, yeah. They're the ones that are compiling all your data and trying to do something weird with it. Yeah. I guess Apple's trying to keep everything pretty local. That's mm -hmm. been their claim right. to fame. Yeah. The privacy aspect mm -hmm. of it. All right, enough about the new sure. devices, iDevices talk. Uh, let's talk about some, some pop culture. We don't have any musical transitions because we don't have the mixer here today. Right. Yep. But I thought it would be a perfect time to, to do some pop culture. Jeremy, you can no, it's good. look over Go. that way. Uh, Devendra, you said you saw Ad Astra? I, I've seen Ad Astra. In a, it was a Limax presentation, but uh, I loved it. I love James Gray's movies. Um, I certainly know going into a James Gray movie, it's not going to be it's a normal film. I'd say like he makes these really cool, introspective movies. Um, he did The Immigrant a couple years ago. Lost which City of Z. Cool. Lost City of Z, yeah. Um, which is, this movie feels very similar to Lost City of Z, except instead of like going into an unknown jungle or something, you're going out deep into space. It's a journey. It's a journey, and I loved it because it's it's like a deep, introspective film. It can have these big ideas, and it's also like great and pulpy and crazy mm. at certain points. Like there's a shootout on the moon, which is like, I've never seen this before, and yeah. I've, seen, I've seen so many movies. This movie does so many things new, which is just something I really respect in any movie, yeah. I, I felt like coming out of it, I wanted to find the novella that it was based off sure. of, when, but there was none because it's an original story from yeah. James Gray and co -writer. Although it seems like I think the, the because Brad Pitt play, plays a guy who's a little disconnected from reality and himself, I think. Um, I feel like we've seen that archetype before, the sort That's, of like lonely lost man. So it yeah. feels familiar in a way, uh, but I think they do some really interesting things with it. Yeah, so it definitely is you know, about one man's journey, mm -hmm. his internal struggles. Yeah. You his know, daddy issues. Daddy yeah. issues yeah. and you know, just like, White dude with daddy issues yeah. movie. If you're okay getting past that, I think what you would love about it, Jeremy, is the world building. Mm -hmm. They do some really cool. What would it be like if commercial space flight was a real thing? Oh man, it's so it's so like perfectly. It's like wondrous in a way, but also like unlike 2001, I think it's like very cynical about how very like cynical. if we built you know, a moon base and mm. like had space tourism to the moon, you bet your ass there's an Applebee's on that moon base. Mm -hmm. yeah. And like the grossness of every strip mall will be on that moon base because that's who we are. You know, it's sort of like the greatness of humanity and also the low lows. Uh, there is an Applebee's, there's yeah. certainly there's like- There's a fine line between yeah. realism and cynicism. Oh yeah. <laughs> and yeah. yeah, it pays homage to 2001 yeah. with the whole scene where he is taking the commercial space flight to the moon and you have yeah. the flight attendants you know, provide the drinks and yeah. he has to buy a $125 blanket. Yeah. So there's a little bit of, hmm. of that like commercialism of and space. And a little more, it feels more realistic too because it's not like, oh, this is a really cool jet you know, uh, cabin or something. Right. It's, 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 a a, it's a rocket. It's still ship. a tiny rocket thing. It's everyone yeah. strapped around a tiny little thing. Was that branded? You mentioned that, 2001. No, I think that, that, that was no, like what's version? Was it a Virgin rocket? It was, uh, there was a Virgin Galactic uh, yes. sign in, yes. the, uh, in the spaceport on the hmm. moon, but yeah. the rocket itself was just a standard commercial rocket yeah. okay. to the moon. And they did a lot of thinking out like what the quarantine period would be, mm -hmm. how do you use the moon as a stop on the way to Mars, mm -hmm. that kind of stuff. Like that world building is yeah. great to see on screen. Pirates on the moon. Pirates, Pirates on the moon. Pirates on the moon, come on. Ah, that is so... Yeah. It's so good. The idea that we would create this thing and then, of course, like, yeah, people who just want to steal. I guess people who just want to take advantage of this entire system. I'm intrigued. This sounds it's like fun. a good film. It doesn't sound like it resonated with you. This, yeah. The emotional story did not resonate with me, but the everything about the like the, the world building, absolutely. You like that. Did. Okay. Really, uh, I think really good. And again, if you see it in the biggest screen possible. See it in IMAX um, if you it can. It looks really yeah. gorgeous. Yeah, mm -hmm. uh, and you also said you recently watched okay, a film that's not out yet. Yes, it's, uh, it's not out yet. Gemini Man. I've seen Gemini Man, Ang Lee's Gemini Man. I can talk about, I can't talk about like, I can't review the movie, but mm -hmm. I can talk about the tech. And I saw it at the, uh, the Dolby Theater in New York. So like their little private theater. I saw it in 120 FPS, 2K, 3D. They did film it in 4K 120 FPS. So I really wonder if there's a big difference there. Um, Remind me what the premise is, what's the setup? So Gemini Man is basically two Will Smiths. Oh, right, right, right. And not, not your Will Smith. Yeah, right. The, you know, the, the, the famous actor Will Smith, uh, although I would love to see two Will Smiths in his own take on Gemini no, Man. No, so would he. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> this one is current Will Smith and younger, like 20-something Will Smith. Um, it's an action movie where he plays an assassin who basically finds out his younger self is also trying to kill him. So it's a weird movie because it's kind of like, it's a pulpy spy movie. In a way, like it starts off with a really cool scene where he's trying to shoot a guy on a moving train. 
like snipe a guy from a moving on a moving train. Cool scenarios like that. Like there's this great motorcycle sequence I think looks really cool. Uh, but what really stands out is the high frame rate, and it just it doesn't look like anything I've seen before. Um, well, there are two saw, pieces yeah. of tech, right? Like this one, one yeah. in terms of the digital human, right? What a digital did the younger Will Smith, uh -huh. and yeah. where a lot of people might have assumed that Will Smith did performance capture and they de-aged him much like Sam Jackson was yep. for Captain Marvel. The entirety of the young Will Smith is a CG character. Yeah. Not motion captured, not it's There not is performance capture. There is some, there is some yeah. performance capture. By Will Smith? Double, I think by Will Smith, and okay. then obviously when he's yeah. acting against another, you know, right. a, 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 performer, mm -hmm. but the whole head is a CG image. It's okay. not de-aging, moving wrinkles. Okay. Because I, I was sitting in a round table with Ang Lee and he was talking about like de-aging is not just a process of making your face smoother, like there's a lot more changes that have to go on there. So they had to make it a completely new character. Uh, it sounds like it was mainly a manual thing, like it was just the artist like painstakingly doing it. So I don't know how much machine learning there was involved. I know some of the studios have like smart machine learning technology to kind of do this stuff. Uh, this just seems like really painstaking animation. But the really cool thing about that is that they were able to make the fight scenes like super brutal. So in a normal fight scene, right, if somebody punches, it's like, it's like a stage punch, right? It's somebody, you see the angle of a swing, you see somebody reacting. Mm -hmm. In this movie, there's some like knockdown drag out fights where they're just like going at it and like skin is tearing. They're like really punching each other really hard. And because the younger Will Smith is CG, like they can bring that character into the punch, like in a more visceral way. So I think it's a cool, it feels like a 90s sci-fi movie in a way, so I think it's a little cheesy, the script isn't great, but the, the tech I think is cool, the high frame rate stuff. Yes. He did that with Billy Lynn a couple years ago, and I saw that, I think that was only presented in 120 FPS in like three theaters in the world. I think New York, Taiwan, and LA. And that um, was filmed in 120, yeah. and you need to basically have the projector system, much like for Hobbit, uh, the first Hobbit it's film, even more you needed that, that 48 yeah. FPS projector. Yeah. You need it was a 120. 3D, 120 FPS as well. Wow. So, wow. Yeah. So it's it's that movie was weird because it was like watching basically a play with giant giant humans. Like it was yeah. like watching normal people because it was so clear, like you were looking through a window. Well, that sounds very yeah. complimentary because the Hobbit it got a lot of soap opera. Hobbit right? was bad. Hobbit was bad because they didn't change the way they made that movie. Like they basically made that movie like the way they made a normal 24 FPS film. Right. So Ang Lee was talking about like, when you're doing something like this, you have to change the way you light. You have to change the way you present a scene. You can't edit the way you normally do. Like you may mm. have to let scenes last a little longer. Hmm. So he's basically inventing a whole new language of filmmaking to deal with this. Hmm. Uh, I think this movie is more successful than Billy Lynn was because that was just not a great film. This one, the action is so exciting and visceral because it's moving in such a more realistic way. So that motorcycle sequence, it's not very fast, but it's very visceral because like, oh man, it feels like you're moving down the street with Will Smith and his doppelganger is like trying to overrun him. There's some really cool stuff. Are there really any like plans to get 120 hertz content in the home? I mean, you can, I think some TVs already support. Well, I know they support 120, yeah. but do they support 120 hertz input? You know, a lot of them are just yeah. interpolating. I'm not quite sure. I know, I think the new LG TV is like, they were saying 4K 120 FPS is something we can do. Hmm. I'm not sure how it's gonna work for this. And the, the harder thing is there's no way to present it in the home. Like the Billy Lynn thing, uh, I have the 4K Blu-ray for that. That's 60, it's 60 FPS 4K. And then there's a separate Blu-ray and 3D thing. So you can't get, you can't get 4K 63. We just don't have the, I mean, the yeah. new standards aren't out yet for the throughput. Yeah. And it's for a shame, like data. you, I think the cool thing is like, you'll probably never get this tech at home. Like mm. you have to go to a movie theater, you have to sit with a crowd. It's by design, right? Yeah. It's, and it's, it's kind of what he wants. He wants us to go back to the theater. So I think it's funny you see him pursuing it this way with like this incredibly modern tech and also Christopher Nolan doing his thing, bringing back IMAX, like big stage films. Also something you can't quite do it at home. Like you can't really, you can watch Dunkirk at home, but you can't really watch it the way you do at a full-size IMAX theater or something. So, you know, both of them are pursuing this, and I think it's kind of cool, yeah. Okay. What about watching it in a VR headset? <laughs> well, that's a, that would be 90 at most, unless yep. you were on- Unless uh, you were in the index. index. Oh, I like what you were thinking. <laughs> but you wouldn't get all the, you wouldn't get all the, the pixels. You wouldn't get all the resolution. Not I think yet. the index Not would be yet. kinda cool. Yeah, you wouldn't get the resolution, but you get like the index's weird speaker things, which sound amazing. Oh, yeah. They sound better oh, yeah. than headphones. Yeah, like totally. that would probably be the best way to do it right now. Yeah. Wow. Mm -hmm. uh, and you mentioned the LG TVs with firmware updates, and yep. they're adding you know, G-Sync support. So adding G-Sync, which is surprising, yeah. yeah. You get plugged to a PC, and then it's, it's for those people who are using these big 4K OLEDs as oh, yeah. PC monitors. I do that, I do that. I do. it's great. And yeah. so the, yeah. these TVs do support 120 input? 
The newer ones do. Yeah. Oh, interesting. Yeah. yeah. Okay. The, I have a 2016 LG OLED, so it's 60 FPS at most, but still, like, I'm playing control. I play B6. most, like, mm -hmm. hmm? B6. it's a B6, yeah. I guess that shouldn't surprise yeah. me if, if monitors are doing it. It's, yep. Yeah. 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 We have the same TV. Yeah. How about B6, that? LG. All right. It's the B16 right. model. Nice. Although and we want the C9. Yeah. A lot of things I think are changing too. Like we've seen more gaming monitors come out. So Dell and Alienware showed off their gaming OLED, and that thing has you know has all the tech you'd want. It really low response rate. So I think next year CES is going to be really fascinating for displays in general. Yeah. Hmm. All right, there's one bit of pop culture news I want to talk about. Sure. Uh, I tried to get us into VR. Oh, no. <laughs> one bit of pop culture news, and it is Jurassic World related, because this <laughs> broke last night uh -huh. at a screening for a uh, battle at uh, what's called uh, Big Rock, or mm. what was it called? That, that, you see that short film that I Colin Trevenow no. uh, made? They made like an eight minute short film to kind of connect, to tell people what's happened since the events of Fallen Kingdom. Okay. And at, they played it in a theater, and one of the Q&A questions, they did a Q&A with him afterward. You know, the movie's, the third film is in production right now, mm -hmm. um, but they did Q&A, and one of the first questions that was asked was, uh, will there be any returning cast members, because Jeff Goldblum was in Fallen Kingdom. For three seconds, Yes, basically, he did yeah. some, some testimony, right? Mm -hmm. He Goldblum did it up. I was in the trailer, it was good enough, right? Sure. And then, as a surprise, Colin Trevino brought out Laura Dern. Really? And Laura Dern That's pretty confirmed baller. there, like in, yeah. as a surprise. Wow. Hmm. You, they knew that question was going to be asked, yeah. or maybe it was a plant, don't know. Right. Did Collider. Samuel like, drop down from the ceiling or and, something? And, well, Samuel wasn't there, but they did <laughs> announce that Laura Dern, Sam Neill, and Jeff Goldblum what? will wow. all be back. Oh, wow for the third Jurassic World. I'm sure World. they're like just dropping money bags at their doorstep, like, you know you gotta do this. <laughs> so none of them were in Jurassic World, right? None of them were in the first one. And what about yeah. the second one? Goldblum was Goldblum the second one. Just, just Goldblum, though. Did not interact with any of the, the Chris Pratt, Bryce yeah. Dallas Howard. It was just like uh, on screen, te on TV testimony to Congress. Well, that's cool. And they're gonna bring back the original cast. These movies make me angry. I hated, so I hated <laughs> Jurassic World. I thought it was yeah, like yes, a disaster right. of a movie. Yep. The second one, not, I think it's still a bad script because mm. it's a Colin Trevorrow script, and thank God, like thank goodness he he's not, he's not doing Star Wars. Like <laughs> I, I like I don't know. I prayed and something happened, and he mm -hmm. didn't end up doing Star Wars. Uh, but the second one, at least, like they had it. They had it was Jay but Bayona, yeah. who I think is a great director. He did the Orphanage. Um, the he visuals made it a horror of, film. Yeah, he he made it like a horror film. The visuals of the second one work because he knows how to tell a visual story, like Colin Trevorrow. Um, even though the script was terrible, that was still a fun movie to watch, basically. Yeah, this one, is it Trevorrow doing it? He is. Yeah. 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 <laughs> I, bet, I bet it's gonna be a great ode to nostalgia and nothing else. I will yeah. say there's an excellent new pinball machine out, okay. Jurassic Park. <laughs> they were given the opportunity to do World, they okay. chose Park. Yeah, I think nobody wisely. wants World. Yes. Yeah. Before we continue, I want to let you know that this week's episode is also made possible with support from Caseda Smart Lighting Control from Lutron, pioneers in smart home technology. A lot of people think you need smart bulbs to get smart lighting, but there's a smarter way. Caseda's smart dimmers and switches replace the switch on your wall so all the lights controlled by that switch will act smart. Think about all the places in your home where one switch controls multiple bulbs. Ceiling lights, chandeliers, bathrooms, and more. With Caseda, you'll save money by replacing the switches instead of replacing all those bulbs. Smart bulbs are only smart when the switch is on, and if someone flips it off, you can say goodbye to that smart control and connectivity. But Caseda switches are always smart, even if the switch is off. And with Caseda dimmers, you don't need to buy smart bulbs to enjoy smart lighting. You actually get the best of both worlds. Smart lighting control from an app or your voice, and control right at the switch. We have these switches set up in our baby's nursery, so when our hands are full and we're feeding the baby to put them to bed, we can adjust the lights without having to move at all. Get smart lighting the smart way with Caseda by Lutron Smart Switches. Learn more about Caseda at lutron.com slash test. That's lutron, L-U-T-R-O-N dot com slash test. Well, that's the big pop culture news. We're gonna jump then to tech. A few things happening in the tech world before we get to VR. One, the same day as Oculus Connect, Amazon is hosting a big event in yep. Seattle. They do these like every six months now, right? <laughs> like a big, here's a slew of Alexa devices. They're also very bad at it too, like just in terms of organizing it and presenting these events. It's kind of funny. But yeah, I, I love watching Amazon try. And now, the glasses. Now the glasses, so The big yeah. announcement, it is Amazon Echo Frames. Smart frames. glasses with Alexa 
integrated. Okay, and you say there's one style. There's, it is a black. Not unlike black your glasses. Not glasses. unlike yeah. our glasses. Right. Yes, <laughs> yes. Mine are, mine are multicolored. His are it's definitely more black. stylish than yeah. yours. Yeah. So <laughs> looking at the, the photos of the glasses, it looks like the actual, um, what do you call this? The uh, arm? The arms mm -hmm. of the glasses are much thicker. Yeah. They're I think not, there is a tiny speaker there. It's not bone conduction like the uh, the bows, is it? Yes. No. Uh, and so the arms are thicker because they have are, are obviously a modems or a cellular connection or Wi-Fi mm -hmm. connection. It is going to connect to. Well, you don't know if it's cellular or Wi-Fi. I think it is. It might connect to your phone. Actually, uh, this so news was like all happening while we were stuck yeah. in the Oculus yeah. stuff. So I'm I'm also catching up to this. Yeah. Huh. Yeah, so all day battery life, it will be able to have no, there's no camera, this isn't, these aren't snap spectacles. Or display, I there's, assume. There's no display. It's all audio. It's just audio Great. where you can queue up the smart assistant and you can get your know, Frankly, this makes more sense to me than Google Glass. I think this, <laughs> I mean, but we're an Alexa family. We have sure. absolutely embraced this in every home and in every room in our house. Mm -hmm. The kids use it more than computers, I think, just to get sure. random information. Um, it has, uh, so there are swipe gestures, gestures on the side of it. It does connect to your phone. That's how it can do phone calls as well. So you can do phone calls built in. Hmm. Uh, and uh, what is it, 30, 31 grams, 180 bucks, and they are invite only. Much like the first gen <laughs> Alexa. Only. Yeah, much or like, Google Glass. So basically yeah. the Alexa before it actually started functioning well. I don't that remember that. Gen, there was yeah. a private invite only phase. It was private, it was really bad because they didn't have the voice data. So like the voice recognition didn't oh, work funny. really well. And it took yeah. like six months for them to like, take that data, do yeah. something with it, and then they released it a while I, I later. hope they nailed the microphone on this, because that's going to be crucial. They said not only the microphone they think have, they've nailed, but also directional uh -huh. speakers, so only you can hear the really? assistant. Really? Huh. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yes, yeah, so they, also, they also announced some earbuds and a, a loop ring. I think the um, earbuds look cool. Like, yeah? they look cooler, because they're noise-canceling earbuds with some Bose tech in them. So also that's, with Echo built in? I no? think I, there is Alexa. Like, Everything built in. must have them built in. Wow. And also, pretty much every single pair of wireless headphones has like voice assistance if you hit right. a button. So. Yeah, the, the Sony ones have Google. Yep. Like they, they're all just APIs that you can tap into. Yep. But those look cool and more useful. Like the glasses just seem like they do these weird experiments sometimes, and this seems like an Amazon experiment. I don't know if it's going to work out. They look fine, but mm -hmm. also not like. I'm more worried about like the the widespreadness of Alexa and the way they're handling the data and everything. Like I use Alexa Home yeah. in a lot of different rooms, um, but I'm getting wary of giving up all this information and I don't know so much of my family's data to one company that's certainly not been proven to be very useful. So you got to give it spread the love around. Spread give, around you, yeah. give all your personal information to like four or five companies. Yeah. and then and then Apple. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Apple will have your your most sensitive data. Um, so that's the big product stuff. On the uh, software side, the big news this week, also uh, Apple Arcade, of course, launched last week. People, you reviewed some of the early games. For I did, I got to see that. Really, mm -hmm. I think your article is the first one that really turned me around. It's, it's amazing. It's really good. Like, Norm, I'm Norm was very skeptical about super this. Super skeptical. I can understand why, because we have way too many subscription services, certainly like um, where you have like Xbox Live or you have Game Pass, which has a ton of things. Um, but it's five bucks a month. Uh, they have announced up to 100 games. The thing is the quality of the games are so good. Like there are no microtransactions. Love there's it. no, there's none of the like ickiness of modern mobile games. And also they feel like great little indie games too. So you have mm -hmm. things like Overland, I believe it's called. Yeah. That's yes. on the Switch. That yeah. game is 25 bucks on the Switch. That's on Steam. It's on yeah. Steam. That game costs a lot of money on other platforms, mm -hmm. whereas now you get it as part of this service. Um, Was that a simultaneous other... launch? I think so, yeah. Okay. Yeah, and I'm playing uh, What the Golf right now. I've been playing that on the plane right over mm -hmm. here. That game is amazing. Like for, I've been talking to people like they are calling it their game of the year. Just Nidhogg because plus uh, so many things. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Really? Yeah, mm -hmm. go through the history of humanity, but it's like a kind of um, a stick figure. I thought that was cricket through the ages. Oh, that maybe is, I'm thinking cricket through the ages. Cricket yeah. through yeah. the ages. What, yeah. Which one is what the golf? Uh, what the golf is like a. It is a golf game, but it also kind of reinvents the concept of golf. So uh. you start out playing it like, oh, you're just swinging a golf club, but then you're swinging yourself, and then you're like swinging different objects and cars and like the rules at every level changes too so it's not just golf it's just using the mechanics of like swinging uh, yeah a, and it plays well because i watched the video of that and it, it got like katamari vibes yeah. and it can be it's like oh i want to be katamari for an episode error for one level and it does it wants to be 2d mario for a level and it does and hmm. all just using the golf gesture basically hmm. i think wow. it's it's super cool and inventive yeah, and some of these of games are now that iOS 13 is out on yep. iPad. They're on iPad. They're coming to uh, Apple TV, TV, Apple TV yeah. as well. Mad Mad interfaces. Yeah, I think it. the other cool thing is you can start a game and then yeah, play it across every single platform yeah. too. So 
Uh, it's kind of cool. Most are exclusive. They're all exclusive to iOS mm. on the mobile side. So Apple also like cut out Android by doing this thing. So there's good and bad to it. I'm not not a fan of game exclusivity. Uh, but yeah, if they're supporting developers well and well, yeah. people Th access those to are the two things, questions. Yeah. One is can they maintain interest because they have a such strong lineup, mm -hmm. and if it's going to be 100 games, how can they ensure that people aren't just playing for the free month or sure. two months and then canceling? I think because there, there are too many games to play in one right. month, to be honest. Yeah. Right. Oh, yeah. And can there be a cadence of high quality mm -hmm. releases, whether it's secured through exclusivity or through development time that they're backing, to make this compelling as a long term? Business right. Yeah. I would, can Apple that? ever get to the point where there's simply a revenue share? There's not an investment. Well, that's the other question. How are they paying developers? We don't because know. And they don't no one knows that. and don't close. Yeah. And we have well. a little bit of inkling on that on the Google side, because the news this week is Google has their own arcade subscription service mm -hmm. that they're launching to compete mm. with this. Uh, it's called, what is it called? It's called Remember Google Play. <laughs> yeah. We're still here. Yeah, that's exactly it, right? Um, and it's, I think it's like a, it's cheaper or there's a longer trial. It's still trial, five bucks a month, I think, yeah. Longer trial period Maybe, or, yeah. or something. Um, it's called Google Play Pass. 350 Android games and apps for $5 a month. Are they new? Are uh, they no exclusive? Ads. See, that's the question. No <laughs> in-app purchases, and it's $2 introductory price for the first well, year, $2 a month. I mean, they're price. getting the, the important part right, which is no in-app purchases and uh, no ads. Well, mm -hmm. the, the benefit of no in-app purchase is you're hoping that's going to create a higher quality experience from a development perspective. Right? Well, Developers right, are right. less incentivized well, to create the microtransaction model exactly. or the, the click and buy model. Sure. But if they're being paid, like for example, on the Google side, it sounds like they're being paid based on engagement time. So hmm. the longer someone plays your game versus one of the other 350 games, you get a bigger right. revenue share, then they're incentivized to kind of do more kind of clicky, addictive, bad behavior type Just draw games. it out a little. Or draw it yeah. out somehow. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I don't like that so much. I just, you, your kids are young, they're probably not yeah. using the iPhone too much. From my perspective, with mm -hmm. a 9 and 12 year old, this Apple Arcade is fantastic. Because the, I can't tell you how many games my daughter wants to get that sure. are free. Sure. They don't cost me anything, but they, they just contaminate her mind with advertisements every 20 seconds. And those ads are terrible. I've seen yeah. some kids' games ads. They're, they're kind of bad. They yeah. start, it's easy for the ad to direct the kid to something where they start paying or something crazy. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right, uh, moving on from tech, I did want to ask you, Devendra, you've yep. been reviewing a bunch of stuff for Engadget. Any exciting things that you reviewed that you wanted to share, that things that have surprised you in the past six sure. months? I think, I mean, gear? the Switch Lite is very good. And I think we didn't really expect much from it because it is just a smaller Switch, but it is lighter. It's, it's more portable in every way. Like, to me, it proves that the Switch was kind of a compromise for Nintendo. Uh, the big, the way I think of it, it's sort of like the Switch is like, okay, Nintendo threw game pads on a tablet, and that's just wonky, it's unbalanced, it's not very light, and this one just feels like game pads on a phone, and I th that experience, it makes it more useful and something I want to pull out more, uh, yeah, more throughout the day. Because it turns out people were not developing games that were under the tablet mindset, sure, where you'd be sure. playing with just a touchscreen, you're still thinking of this as a console, mm -hmm. Pro Controller, or the Joy-Cons, and so this feels more like a, a, the, the PS Vita style, sure. you know, PSP, the form factor was better. And also not many, I think people weren't doing as much motion control stuff. Um, mm. Certainly games like ARMS and some others early on were trying to take advantage of that. It was just never that good. I bought ARMS, I played like five minutes of it, and I yeah. just like, this does not control well, I don't like anything about this. Um, you could still play those games on the Switch Lite, but it's just a lesser experience. And hooking it to the TV wasn't a huge draw either, I would well, guess. Well, I love, that's the thing. I love playing my games on the TV. So mm. even if I were to go, if I were to go buy a new console today, it would still be the Switch because I want that TV compatibility. But I've talked to a lot of people who never play their Switch on a TV. And in that case, the Switch Lite is here and it's kind of kind of perfect for what it is. Mm -hmm. Yeah. If you're if you own a Nintendo Switch and you own one from like the first gen, yeah, you can't get a lot of money back for now because obviously there's a refresh of it that gives you longer battery life and that's a little more highly sought after. And you can also spend like seventy bucks at GameStop and they'll upgrade you to the refresh, which yes, I think for a lot of people that kind of makes yeah, sense if you yeah. want that. Yeah, I will say that if you have had your Switch sitting in like the drawer for you know you played Breath of the Wild and mm -hmm. you were good and you didn't buy any new games and maybe you're curious about the resale market or maybe buying a Switch. Light, don't update the firmware huh. because the earlier firmware, I don't know the exact model, is still bootleggable. You can oh, okay. still so you can do cool stuff. Can do, yeah. Yeah, and that was patched. So if you're looking to offload your first gen switch, don't update the firmware, check the, uh, the version number, go online and, and advertise that, and you might be able to get more for it that way. 
on eBay. On, on eBay or Craigslist. Or yep. People are looking for those, those early unpatched versions. So, I remember the same thing was with the PSP. Yeah, 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 <laughs> yeah. So have you done uh, any of the uh, the port mini consoles, the, the Sega Mini? I or did. The I reviewed. Genesis? I reviewed the PlayStation Mini, which mm. felt like a complete waste of time. Uh, but that's been hacked. To, that and, was already and hacked. improved. Hacked and improved, but at that point, just get a get a little nice Raspberry Pi box yeah. or something like that. Doesn't make look your as own. cute though. It doesn't. Uh, the Genesis one seems fine. I wish it didn't have the three button controller. Like that's right. the thing. Only that's the Japanese a version has the six buttons. Terrible controller. <laughs> it was yeah. always a terrible controller. Like hitting a button. I remember in like grade school, like having a hit. It was at start or select to switch between punch and kick and Street Fighter. And I just felt like even then, I was like eight years old. I was like there got, there's got to be a better way than this. So this what does the Japanese bad. controller do? It's six buttons. Gotcha. Huh. Yeah. Which is how I think eventually Genesis moved to that. Yeah. yeah. In, in the states. Yeah. Huh. yeah. It looks a little different too, it's the Nintendo yeah. on the Nobody, side. I, they do these things for nostalgia, like on Sony, they gave us, uh, it was the original PlayStation controller in the in the mini console. You c they had games that supported the analog sticks, so, so playing a game like Metal Gear Solid without the analog sticks felt really bad. Yep. Like Sony just didn't really think about what they were building there. Mm. I hope we're seeing the end of all these like mini console re-releases. Uh, the only one I'd love to see is sort of like, I wish Sega had enough money to do like a little Dreamcast, a little cute Dreamcast, or Dreamcast and a Raspberry Pi. That'd be great. I think I love the Dreamcast. Mm -hmm. And a lot of those games still hold up and look better than mobile games and mini games today, mm -hmm. yeah. All right, we're gonna move to VR, AR. Now, the first two things <laughs> I wanna talk about, not OC related, one on the Vive side, the Cosmos is of course coming sure. out next week now, I wanna say. Yeah, October 3rd is when the Vive Cosmos is coming one, out. I think coming home soon, as soon as I get home, yeah. Mine, mine just arrived today, <sighs> so I might be even setting up tonight. Uh, but there's a, uh, it's modular, right? It's one yeah. of the big selling points of the Vive Cosmos is the fact that you know, you'll be able to do wireless add-ons, you can do the Steam tracking add-on later. For, Although you could, think, you could have done that with the original Vive. There were yes. add-ons yes. that like, it took a while, but there were add-ons, yeah. And, and just new, for clarity, this is the update to the Vive. Yes, this yeah. is replacing the, the OG Vive, right? Mm -hmm. 700 bucks, inside out tracking, it's new controllers. Uh, there's a new add-on that was just announced, and it's gonna be eye tracking. Nice. It's a Chinese company. Um, and it'll be- Not Toby. It's no, it's not company. Toby, it's uh, Seven in Venson, and it's huh. eye tracking with a module that goes inside the eye box, huh. um, and, and then of course sends a signal, 150 bucks. And so that's actually not that bad. It, and it plugs into the USB jack? Yes, plugs in the USB interesting. jack. It's interesting because uh, Toby did it for the uh, Vive Eye, I believe. Uh -huh. yes. They've been doing it for a lot of different devices. Like they're basically standard on Alienware computers now, yeah. too. Like they're everywhere. Yeah. Yeah, so it tracks your eyes at 120 hertz, mm -hmm. and um, it came out of the Vive, uh, the Vive X accelerator program. Huh. I wonder if that will ever take off with consumers, because I can see yeah. the uh, enterprise you know, purpose. Clearly, sure. they want to just track all kinds, get all kinds of data. But I wonder, it, it could be implemented in the games, but you would have to have, you know, you don't want to put the cart before the horse. You have I think to have it's more like, yeah, we have to wait for developers to adopt it. But it, to me, it seems like an essential feature. Like it's not just an optional thing. Mm -hmm. Moving forward, VR in five years, we need eye tracking because it is so, it's so good. And when it comes to like the whole idea of VR presence, making eye contact with somebody. That's my thought that, too. That makes a difference. Even so making just eye for contact social. with a character. For social, it's yep. great. They do these weird things. I've seen a lot of Toby demos where like, if you're looking at an object in, distant, in the distance and you pick up something and throw it, you'll hit the exact thing you're looking yeah, at. So it's kind demo. of auto-aim. It's a yeah. little bit of like giving the superpower. Yeah, yep. it feels, it just feels kind of amazing. And the other thing too is for foveated rendering, as VR gets to be higher and higher quality, you wanna, you wanna pump more pixels to where your eyes are exactly looking. Mm -hmm. So it makes foveated rendering better too. So once we get up to like 8K VR or something where it gets so sharp, you don't want to waste processing with things you're not directly looking at. So it kind of helps to sharpen that as well. Yeah. And I guess the question is whether these third party accessories can survive and will be the way forward or sure. if it's going to be highly integrated like the way Facebook's doing it with their own hardware, their own, their own software. I think there have to be some standards too and also as we evolve eye tracking, like that gets into really weird data, like data problems, because then it's sort of like the minority report thing where like, oh, you're really, what are you doing with this eye data? Are you capturing my like specific custom eye data? And will you, will you be able to like tag an ad to me as I'm walking down the street, like in minority report? Yeah. That's a problem. And all these different companies building it is, is rough. And certainly if Facebook is going to be doing the same thing, that worries me because Facebook can't even build a video conferencing tablet without screwing up the data. 
Like, they, they don't know how. Um, so that worries me. Like, as cool as I think a lot of this tech is, I'm worried about all these companies. Uh, I did recently talk to Toby. I think they're interested in forming, like, some sort of, like, open consortium of eye tracking data. But everybody else has to join in right now. It can't just be one company doing it. Mm. Um, and then the other bit of uh, non-OC6 VR AR talk is uh, news is Tilt 5 launched their uh, their Kickstarter campaign mm -hmm. just yesterday. This is uh, Jerry Ellsworth's uh, latest iteration of the Cast AR technology, mm -hmm. which a Kickstarter of seven years ago, 2013, <laughs> yeah. six years ago. I think it did a, a million and a half in terms of Kickstarter uh, campaigns back then. It was a little cheaper, mm -hmm. um, and uh, but 3, it never came back. Yet. Yeah, they they refunded all the the back and for one reason or another, I think it was mostly business on the business end, it didn't work out. Mm -hmm. So they've refined the hardware. We have a video out um, uh, where I chatted with Jerry about what's improved so in Tilt 5. Can you remind me what, what exactly is this thing? Ah, so uh, it's an AR, a pair of AR glasses where as opposed mm -hmm. to using uh, traditional uh, lenses, where like the whole lens and Magic Leap both use waveguide systems sure. for AR, where they're using you know laser projectors or very tiny projectors that then um, go through a very flat lens that kind of a point the rays in the right places so mm -hmm. it can be very small profile and you can see objects on certain planes. But all um, of this happens internally inside the headset. Inside the headset. And it's uh, there's obviously benefits and trade-offs to that. The size is good, power is good, but then you get visual artifacts and also you get a very small field of view. It's very tough to make a waveguide that fits all the kind of uh, things necessary for widespread AR. Mm -hmm. And then the other AR tech that you see popularized that Meta did and you see like Unreal doing is it's using... It's just a big mirror. It's yeah. a, exactly. It's, yeah. it's a combiner system where they have some type of, uh, uh, they, call it, they call it a bird box cavity, uh -huh. and then you kind of bounce you know, a, mm -hmm. a OLED screen against a, a silvered mirror, and then the world comes in, and there are some benefits to that, but you're locked in one plane of focus. It's huge, it's like wearing a huge helmet. And yes. It's still so, limited field of view. And, and still limited field of view. Mm -hmm. I think Unreal is probably the best implementation of that, but then also you see less of the outside world. Sure. Like you know, the visibility of how much Pass through you get from the outside world is diminished by like 30% or 50%. Uh, this system uses projectors that project from the glasses out into the world, mm -hmm. and then the image comes back to you via a retroreflective material. Mm -hmm. So the most common analogy is this is the same material that's uh, used in uh, stop signs and, and traffic signs, where if you shine a light at it, the light ray bounces exactly back from where it came from. So you can only use it on surfaces that have the material. And in huh. this case, they're designing for tabletop gaming. So, so games. multiple people can play on the same material and get their own perspective. Okay. So we're all wearing headsets and we're all blasting these very low light images onto the material, but mm -hmm. because none of that light goes anywhere else, they all go back toward your eyes. I find it weird. Like, uh, I guess this was a big thing. I've, I've heard very little about this product. So In the huh. AR community, I think it's a really interesting thing because people have been following Jerry for a long sure, time. Sure. She came from Valve. This was a tech that she worked on at Valve, and Valve didn't see the potential in it, but let her take it with her sure. to turn okay. into a product. And Cast AR got a lot of support, and so mm -hmm. to see it come back in cool. a new form uh, with uh, a lot of software partners, mm -hmm. development partners. I think D&D is their, you know, they have a, a partnership with Fantasy Grounds, which is a D&D platform um, where people currently play D&D remotely with friends, and mm -hmm. now you can potentially play with these glasses. Um, it solves a lot of problems of AR in terms of the uh, the focus, the uh, combination sure. convergence problem, vergence problem, of uh, objects looking like they're in focus. Um, because what you're seeing is actually there. Is there, mm -hmm. yeah. You know, at least the light sources are actually okay. coming from around that general area. Exactly. Um, and, and it's relatively low cost, and you're just powering it off of, running it off of a, a laptop or a, or a phone. You can mm -hmm. run, run multiple headsets off of a laptop. Huh. Um, and so the Kickstarter, I think, already has met the uh, the yeah. goal of 450,000. I think currently it's about 600,000. Um, but I think less, more important than just how much money they're raising is how many backers they have. Mm -hmm. Right? It's about how many people they can that they can get to invest $300 on a pair of these because they want their developers. They, they want the, the bigger the user base, you get the natural benefits of the sure. network effects of people being able to play with each other and multiplayer, and developers want them to generate content that they can make money off of. Um, so they have, you know, a month ago, um, looking forward to, and I backed it and looking forward to that coming out. Mm -hmm. cool. And that's just on Kickstarter called Tilt5. And before we continue to our next segment, I want to let you know that support for This Is Only A Test is also made possible by Thinkful. If you're looking for something that will take you further in education with outcomes and a team dedicated to you, you need to check out Thinkful. 
Thinkful is a tech bootcamp that's building the world's next workforce with online courses in software engineering, product design, data analytics, and data science. Whether you want to make more money, change career paths, or just expand your employment options, when you join Thinkful, you're supported by a team all focused on one thing, launching your new career. With Thinkful, you'll even have one-on-one -on -one mentors, career coaches, and a thriving local network on hand to make sure you get hired within six months. If not, Thinkful will pay your tuition back so you know you're future-proofed. No wonder their graduates have joined the ranks of companies like Google, Amazon, IBM, and Boeing. Thinkful wants you to think about quitting your job and starting your career. Visit thinkful.com slash only a test today to start building the future you want and take your place in the world's next workforce. That's thinkful, T-H-I-N-K-F-U-L dot com slash only a test. And now back to the conversation. All right, let's get to Oculus Connect. Oh boy. Where do we want to start? Do you want to go through the, the big keynote was this morning? I feel like there, there's one takeaway, and that's the Rift S is dead and pointless <laughs> and useless. So, yeah. okay, yeah. That is, that is the question. Like, yeah. Did they always know that the Quest <laughs> was going to get Link? I think they, they probably were planning on this. Like, this is not a feature you could just add. So Link is the ability to plug in the Quest into a gaming PC and have it function as a Rift or a PC headset. Not through DisplayPort, but through yeah. USB-C USB mm -hmm. that's on the Quest and USB sure. 3.0. Sure. So they're doing some type of compression, you know, whether it's GPU-based compression on the, that's on the, true. Um, they on the PC are. side yeah. that has minimized latency, because that's adds, adds time. Right. Sending that video signal mm -hmm. over data to get, then get you know, they, did, did they specify this? Because I don't remember them hearing about no. it. Or I don't remember because a lot of new GPUs have that. P, they have the VR USB C mm -hmm. connection now too. It is so not I through that port. Okay. It is through a standard USB because they said USB A to C would yeah, also yeah, yeah. work. Yeah, yeah, okay, okay. But the, mm -hmm. we people have been doing this wirelessly since the Quest came out. Mm -hmm. There's AL VR, which is something you can sideload. There's virtual desktop, which you can sideload the component that adds this feature. So you can stream Steam games or other games but badly, wirelessly yeah. to Quest. Yeah. And some people play it and they're mm -hmm. fine with it. I just that little bit of latency made me motion sick, so yeah, I, I, I'm yeah. not okay with it. Because so, it's wireless, and exactly. I, I would not trust that. And Cable. it's still amazingly low yeah. latency, yeah. just not enough, because motion of photons with VR needs to be almost yeah. instantaneous. I think the cable will hopefully solve that issue, yeah. but they didn't really elaborate on it, so maybe maybe They're making their own norm. cable. They said yeah. it would support third-party cables, but they can't certify all of them, yeah. so they're making a they, what they call a high-quality fiber cable, so I don't know what exactly mm. that means, but I, I care, I mean, I'm sure the length of the cable will matter. Yep. I care about like the design of the cable because a braided cable was, if, if it's like the same form factor as the cable that comes with the, the Quest currently, sure. that's not a comfortable cable to plug in and to plug into a PC. Like, no, you're going to need some cable flexible. routing. You're going to need yeah. a little more flexibility um, mm -hmm. and, and a way to route it because I could see that mm. disconnecting from the Quest pretty easy or you, you know, ergonomically you want to not protect being, that port. I want to protect the port yeah. and, and release the tension right mm -hmm. from there. Okay. Yeah. Let's assume that those problems are solved by a third party if not by Oculus. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's going to deliver power. It is. I think that's, yes. that's great. Because you can charge the Quest and be in there for much longer yeah. than a couple sure. hours. That's great. So you, and you can play as long as you need. What we don't know is, is there any latency, detectable latency at all? We don't mm -hmm. know, if, is, are there any video artifacts at is all? Is it 72 hertz? Yeah, we have. Right. Well, it has, to be 70, it has to be 70. It has to be 70. It doesn't have right? to be 70. Oh, but the right. game's not. 60. The game's not rendering at 70. It's rendering at 90, 90. or 80. Yeah. Right. Do the games then render yeah. at lower frame rate? So are I you just, dropping frames? And is there going to be a weird cadence? Mm -hmm. I just wrote this up for Engadget too because it just seemed like it's a weird thing to have. But the Quest display, at least, is better than the Rift S. It's high resolution. It's OLED, which is very nice. So, <laughs> but it's technically more pixels, but. I actually fewer, fewer like sub -pixels. the you like Rift the S more fewer sub -pixels, I am yeah. all in the RGB sub-pixel camp. Yeah, I mean, it's. It, I guess it depends on what you want from the display. Like, you, with the more sub-pixels, you get kind of richer colors. You get a, you get a little more detail there. I like the but contrast. You, you get the contrast OLED. and OLED, I yeah. like the deep black levels. So. You get the IPD adjustment on yeah. the Quest. There, there's a lot of different things. But the Quest is also, what, 72 hertz compared to 80 hertz on yep. the Rift S. So that's another potential downside. I, I can't imagine. Can they really go lower than 72 hertz and really do it I well? I would hate for that to be the standard what is going forward. PlayStation I mean, VR. PlayStation VR well, goes up to 120. Yeah, yeah. but they're not they 120 native hertz. No, yeah. it's 90. Yeah. Okay, so that's still 90. So yeah, I, that's like the biggest problem. Like if they cut back on that, that could hurt a lot of people. But I think like looking at it on paper right now, it just seems like, wow, this is... All of a sudden the Quest went from being like a really cool wireless VR solution for some people 
I think if it, as just wireless VR, at 400 bucks, it was probably a little too much. Um, but now if it can be a pseudo PC VR headset, this is like the perfect all-in-one headset you know, at this point. Yeah. Yeah. We had a conversation on our projections episode uh -huh. about this will come out later. We did a chat with Jason Rubin and Mike Verdue about the content. They talked a little bit about this. And one of the things I asked them was, mm -hmm. Does this mean going forward you're going to focus on, on Quest experiences or PC for Quest experiences and that's sure. going to be internally the new standard? And they were kind of cagey about it because they said they let the market decide. <laughs> you can't really trust the market I, I think here. they let the market decide. If you look at the Rift S sales, maybe like probably, probably not. As Watching that yeah. keynote, every single executive is all in on Quest. All in on Quest. It's, they're so excited about Quest. There I were like five or six different features headed to Quest. They mentioned the Rift S once I think for like one sentence. Like in passing. Yeah, in passing. <laughs> <laughs> we still have PCB. We'll talk about those. Yeah, yeah. Pass-through Plus is coming to Quest. This yeah. is previously something we thought was only possible through right. through the Rift. This Which is, is stereo correct world map. Well, not mm -hmm. world map, but, but camera pass-through. We're rejecting pass-through pass -through with the monochromatic cameras. It makes it, and that makes a big difference because like dealing with normal pass-through in the Quest, it's flat, you don't get depth perception. So like I remember like walking through my living room while I was testing it, I definitely hit my coffee table a yeah. lot. Whereas with the Rift S, I could see exactly where my office table was. I never had yeah. that problem. Oddly, you won't be able to toggle it on and yeah. off. Not I'll, yet. At launch, Not yet. it's a strange thing because that's sort of the best feature of Pass-Through Plus, mm -hmm. but it's coming. It's coming. Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, and then the big thing is hand tracking using the cameras that's on the bottom just, of the cloud. I yeah. really I really wonder if they can manage that. Like What Looks amazes well. me about yeah. that is not that they can do it, but that they can do it at no co uh, processor cost. Sure. You know what sure. I mean? Because like doing world mapping is already a ton of work that they're mm -hmm. doing however they're doing. But to add hand tracking into that, 10 digits mm -hmm. and skeletal, skeletal mapping, and yep. that's impressive. Yeah, um, and that, will, that beta will come out early next year, and they're opening the API, so encouraging developers to create Mm -hmm. games and mm -hmm. experiences that make use of hand tracking, whether it's two hands or one hand mm -hmm. with the touch controllers. because touch hand controllers, is, one hand maybe end up being the sweet spot because you need the touch, touch controllers. Yes, yeah. I totally You need totally the touch agree. controller for something. For laser movement, pointer. Laser pointing, yeah. Haptics. But, um, yes. but I don't think you can like fully expect to replicate like the, the Valve Index situation of finger tracking with two free hands. Certainly not on something it just doesn't feel powerful. Just think about, the, think about the, uh, the classic yeah. FPS game model yeah. where you're holding two hands on a on a gun, right? And right now, if you're holding a pistol and you want to steady it, you have to put these two touch controllers, tracking controllers, over each other mm -hmm. and, and grip with one handed to have the model for the pistol in this instance, and then your other hand hand track to actually grab your hand, mm -hmm. that's going to be much more immersive. I wonder so, how wide the field of view of the track volume is, if it's comparable to the touch controllers. That is a really good question, because it is using all four of the cameras mm -hmm. for potentially for, for hand tracking. But it lacks the active LEDs of a controller to, yeah. you know, Yes, to, to yes. Watch. what the occlusion would be like. A lot of it would be on that skeletal modeling and, and how accurate that is. And, and then, of course, the input. Like, how do you get intention on input? All the gesture-based stuff we've seen in AR so far has been really There's going to be a lot new learning clumsy. curve there. Yeah. Yeah, I think there's going to be a lot of bad ideas about grabbing things that you, 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 don't hold touch, you don't feel it. So you, you grab through it. it. Yeah. But things like, uh, you know, um, Doctor Strange, things where it's augmented things that you're not, or force powers, that kind of thing I think works really well. Mm -hmm. Well, that's early next year and further out in the future, maybe it should have been our top story this week, is a big acquisition on uh, by Facebook with uh, Control Labs. They were a startup that were developing and have a developer kit out there of these wristbands. Think of them as Black Widow's wristbands <laughs> that then read your neural signals mm -hmm. and translate that into Inter interpret that into uh, input, into digital signals. And their big secret sauce isn't just the capturing of these signals non-invasively around mm -hmm. your wrist, but then how they train their software to interpret those as actual finger movements and intentions. Mm -hmm. I'm curious what you feel about, how you feel about this from a <laughs> privacy standpoint. Facebook is terrifying. Like I think yeah. the, the main takeaway <laughs> from this entire show is like control apps is one thing. Like okay, they're gonna they're gonna read our thoughts basically. Like essentially, this is a thing we've always wanted. But they also announced uh, what was it the the live maps mm -hmm. uh, yes. thing, which could be a part of their upcoming AR glasses whenever they actually build those. They did confirm they're building them. Um, but Facebook says they're gonna map the entire world. They're gonna map 3D spaces and then bringing that data into the real world and then add in something like control labs where it's like oh these devices are capturing our thoughts. There are a lot of, you know, there's a lot going on with us. Like, I can imagine, like, if it's trying to capture some of our thoughts, can it start to capture, like, oh, subconscious thoughts? Can it oh, start 100%. to capture, like, 
you know, things you're trying to avoid, like, oh, don't embarrass myself, don't embarrass myself. Can it do something with that data? If somebody hacks your data, like, what sort of embarrassing things could and they do? And how do you train this? your brain yeah. to send a differentiation between a subconscious and a uh, signal and mm -hmm. a conscious signal? Uh, there will be a, a learning curve, a training period. This sounds sure. very far future to me. What is this technology actually capable of now? So there was a keynote that you can watch. The CEO of this at a, the Slush Conference, I believe, did a 60-minute talk demoing their dev kit late last year. And one of the demos was they had the wristbands on and they had one of their users, I think it was he actually, him actually, um, train the system so he could type with no keyboard in front of him and the display would show what he was typing. So he trained his finger, uh, the system, to track the finger signals so that where his fingers were being placed would they get interpreted into the keys of a keyboard and he could type full sentences. Where were the sensors? The sensors are around the wrist. On his wrist, mm -hmm. not on the, the fingers. Not on the fingers, on the wrist. Because all your brain signals go through the wrist anyway and it's just measuring electrical signals. That's, that's hard to believe. <laughs> I mean, it's that, that's kind of it's kind of a magic technology. I'm also surprised. Yeah, we haven't really heard much about this before. They're also a New York-based company too, and I try to like keep an eye on cool New York companies. And I have never really heard much from them. But what was the story too? Like potentially a big, potentially up to a billion dollars. It was the rumor is between 500 million and a billion dollars for, for the acquisition. acquisition. Yeah. So because they raised something. like 76 million, yeah. so like hmm. investors want 10x yep. usually. Yes. So yeah. 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 I mean, it's something that they are well, heavily betting on, not mm -hmm. near term. But they committed, in. they said it would be a part of the next generation of hardware. Yes. That's, we're, that's interesting that this is really the first year where hardware is not a part of the keynote. Yeah. It's that we've always had a new yeah. Rift or a you know, new yeah. mobile. Because the hardware they've been hyping up for so long is here, basically, it's, it's this year. Well, VR yeah. is, is now, right? VR, VR is, is now. Here. Yeah. <laughs> but, they they are talking about the next generation of hardware. Yes. That did come up a couple yeah. times. So the, the other things, I want to go through them quickly because I know you have to go, Jamindra, mm -hmm. uh, but uh, Horizons is their, it's Second Life. Facebook's yeah, Second Life. Second Life, they're ready player, player one, one world. Oasis. Yeah, yeah. And it, it, it's going to probably directly compete with Rec Room. It's you ever play Rec Room? UGC, no. uh, UGC VR, mm -hmm. so you and uh, other people have a shared space. They want you to be creating spaces, creating scripted in, in interactions, mm -hmm. mini games. Mm -hmm. uh, again, going into closed beta mm -hmm. uh, early next year. I mean, it's so, about time. I mean, Facebook is a sure. social media company. They have this platform for years, and they don't really have any kind of social app on it yet. This is cool. Well, they've had a few, but they haven't been good. Let's put that, like a good social app. Oh, like, not like a massively like spaces. social. They, they've had spaces, right? They've but that had was a, that was very not. small Chat number of people. Yeah. yeah, that was not great. This, Conference. This is Second Life. Yeah. And also this together with like some of the stuff we saw from the research side, like uh, some things really freaked me out during this conference, like the the uh, real time avatar mapping of your entire face yeah. and yeah. your facial movements and expressions mapped onto a virtual version of yourself that looks realistic mm -hmm. and yeah, that's it's not just a cartoony thing in a VR world eventually, like You're it looks like the real world. And you're talking about yeah. the Michael Abrash talk yes. at the end of the keynote today. I think that looks great. I'm, I'm excited for that. I'm excited, but again, fa oh boy. That Facebook. doesn't freak me out as much as Facebook deep, going to my face. As deep fakes, yeah. like deep fakes freak me out. Because that's, I mean, that's this fake. This is what it's leading this is to. What it is, this is what it is. Because you could become any person. <laughs> yeah. Because it's, you're, as long as the model is generated, I can imagine people selling. We don't know how models. much of that is based on like photogrammetry, like sure. live no, photography no, there's or no, video. No, no, all there those could are be live generated. texture mapping going on there. That there might not no be modeling. modeling. <laughs> that might not that's, be modeling. That's all skeletal modeling. Well, yeah, we tracking. saw them you wearing don't know headsets, that. and it's probably whatever they can actually mm -hmm. fit in under that. So it's not the Conan O'Brien. You see the lower mouth moving <laughs> in, in front I of us. I think it static. might be more than that than you assume. I from the video. And they talked about how sure. they were they, some of that uh, full body stuff was post you know rendered, not rendered in real time. So they're doing body scans. They showed the room where you have the cameras mm -hmm. and doing that. So you're doing some type of photogrammetry on the body, attaching skeletal models on them. It is performance capture, but I the mean, fact we, that we you can do the capture. They're called Facebook. We should have figured yeah. it out from the beginning. <laughs> <laughs> okay, this is what they wanted to do. <laughs> yes. Wanted to steal our faces. Very true. <laughs> yeah. uh, and then you talked about the room capture stuff. They call it reconstruction, but yeah. it's photogrammetry. It's real time photo, or not real time, but it's photogrammetry of the world so they can capture photorealistic uh, representations of environments and then apply real-time graphical detail like lighting in them. That's something that's during now. It makes a lot of sense. It's part of that AR layer sure. that they call live mapping. This sounds very much like what Magic Leap has been talking about and having an extra layer of mixed reality on top of our reality. Mm -hmm. For that, you're going to need 
a map of the world, right? A, a, a not only a geometric like geometry map of the world. You need a semantic understanding like of the Google world. Street maps, like Street View on steroids, basically. Right. Like they need everything. Everything. And it, I, that is, there are so many red flags in this in this <laughs> conference that I'm certainly worried. But I've also I've realized like. I don't know how much I should be worried because Facebook hasn't proven themselves to be competent, competent enough to really build these things sometimes. But then they do build in, and then they do build like a social network that has a billion, two billion users, and they don't know how to control it or what to do with it too. So that's, that's I, I'm scared by a lot of these things basically, yeah. Yeah. That's, in a nutshell, huh. some of the announcements. There's so much more. We're gonna go through them in detail on our next episode of Projections. Uh, again, your big takeaways were Rift S, Kind Sorry, of dead. users. Kind of dead. Yeah, I, 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 feel I bad can't believe that's for the, case. the buyers. Yeah, you know. I do well, and they're the same price. It is. I, that's why I review, I scored it really low when I reviewed it. It yeah. never seemed like a good deal. There was something so. fishy about them not even developing yeah, it. Yeah, there's like here Lenovo, build exactly. this, build this crappy thing. This is what the people want. Um, maybe well, you could resell it. I that means know. the Quest Two will inherit some of its best features. Hopefully, yeah. right? It's going to make a Franken Quest mod where you put a Lux Audio headset stuff that much more compelling because you'll probably want to use your Quest longer. You know, next generation of Quest can't be 72 hertz. That's got to be 90 hertz. Yeah. But it's also probably two, three years out at this point. Yeah. Who knows? Yeah. How about those fully electronic farifocal lenses? <laughs> oh my God. That was awesome. So that cool. was super cool. So cool. Yeah. It's yeah. a stack of LCDs. Not, they, they drop two half dome yeah, prototype that, that iterations. Bits. So yeah. you get 64 different values. Yeah. It's awesome. Half dome two and three preview, but none of us can use it yet. Yet. <sighs> yeah. It's good that it's not going away because yeah. people. I'd hope that that research that they did with the Verifoco wasn't going to go away uh, because uh, of the Quest, right? Because mm -hmm. that was more of a desktop thing. So, you know, as long as Abrash is there pushing for his virtual workspace, he's going to hammer that virtual workspace <laughs> analogy into the grave. You know, it feels like we're still going to get that cutting edge VR. Um, we have to wrap up the podcast. It went by way too quickly. Thank you so much, Devinger. Where can people find you and uh, online and other sure. things that you do? You can find me on Twitter at, at Devendra. I also do, I write about techandgadget.com. We're also starting a tech podcast there soon, so we haven't had one for a while. Check that out if you're more interested in my thoughts. And also I review movies and TV at the Slash Filmcast at SlashFilm.com. Awesome. Uh, I think that'll do it for this special cool. uh, on-location episode of This and Latest. We don't have any outros this week. Maybe I'll kind of pull an outro okay. audio file and, and put one in. No promises. I'm going to try to get this out. We'll be back with more episodes of Projections this week. Yes. Yeah. Maybe, two, maybe two more episodes. Yeah. And cool. the games. Oh, my God. We're going to talk about Medal of Honor. Oh, games. so much stuff to talk about. We're going to get into our demos. Thank you for listening. Thank you for watching out there. Thank you, Avenger, again. Thank you. And we'll see you next time. Bye. Bye.